Welcome to The Scientist Speaks, a podcast produced by the Scientist Creative Services team. Our podcast is by scientists and for scientists. Once a month, we will bring you the stories behind newsworthy molecular biology research. In this month's episode, we explore how the Human Microbiome Project has changed our understanding of bacterial roles in health and disease. Catherine Loidel from the Scientist Creative Services team spoke with Lita Proctor, former director of the Human Microbiome Project, to learn more. We don't often think about the microbes that live in and on us, but as they inhabit every surface of the human body and play a vital role in human health and disease, we really shouldn't ignore them. Some microbes cause sickness, but most of the time they live in harmony with their human hosts. Beginning in 2007, researchers embarked upon the Human Microbiome Project, organised by the National Institutes of Health. They mapped the normal microbial passengers of healthy humans in phase one of the project, and then addressed the role of the microbiota in inflammatory bowel disease, in the onset of type 2 diabetes, and in pregnancy and preterm birth in phase two. Scientists involved in the Human Microbiome Project anticipated finding new diagnostic biomarkers of health, producing a 21st century pharmacopoeia of the human microbiota and the chemical messengers they produce, and gaining a deeper understanding of human nutritional requirements. One of the biggest surprises from the project was that despite researchers' best efforts, they could not define a healthy microbiome. But the main outcome of the Human Microbiome Project was much larger. It set researchers up with the tools and datasets needed to investigate the microbiome in a way that previously was not possible. The Human Microbiome Project, uh, funnily enough, was inspired by the Human Genome Project, a very famous international effort to sequence the entire human genome. That's over 20 years ago now. And as that international high-profile project was, was wrapping up, the microbiological research community called out and said, stop, you haven't finished the job. You need to sequence the so-called second genome. That, that's kind of a catchphrase for the human microbiome. The Human Genome Project, part of its accomplishments was actually to help develop modern sequencing technologies, high throughput, fast, modern technologies for sequencing DNA. And so the timing was just right. The technologies were there. There was a call from the community to do this. And so NIH decided to invest a large amount of money to develop the tools, the research toolbox for studying the human microbiome. Researchers working on the Human Microbiome Project relied on culture-independent methods for microbial characterization. In the first phase of the project, they performed 16S rRNA sequencing to characterize the complexity of microbial communities at five body sites. The mouth, nose, skin, gastrointestinal tract and the urogenital tract. On a small portion of the samples, they used metagenomic whole genome shotgun sequencing to provide insights into the functions and pathways in the human microbiome. These culture-independent methods propelled microbiology into a new era, extending its focus from the properties of single organism types in isolation to the operations of whole communities. But it all began with recruiting volunteers. There is a very important benchmark cohort study that we undertook in phase one. And that was what we call the healthy cohort study, designed and and structured so that we could ask the question, is there a characteristic healthy microbiome? And how do we find healthy people? Well, these people had to be examined by clinicians and verified to be free of disease. So we set out to recruit about five five or 600 people to be in this healthy cohort study. We went after younger people, assuming that younger people were going to be healthier than an older population. We had a nice mix of men and women. But what happened was two things. One is, even if you're young and healthy, male or female, doesn't matter, 80%, listen to this number, 80% of the American public has oral disease of some kind. Could be cavities, could be gum disease, any number of things like that. And since the criteria for inclusion in this cohort was free of disease, we actually had to send away many, many potential subjects in this cohort to go and get their oral disease taken care of, have their body kind of flush out any antibiotics, and then return and and re-enroll in this healthy cohort study. 
So we did end up with 300 adult men and women, mean age about, I believe, 25 or 26 years old. And that was after having to ask people to go and get their oral disease taken care of uh, before they could enroll in the study. Secondly, the kind of exams that these healthy subjects had to undertake is far more complicated than your typical annual exam. Obviously, not only did we draw blood and collect urine, but we had clinicians for skin condition. We had clinicians to check for oral condition, you know, clinicians, uh, gastroenterologists to check for GI health and name it. So all of those five major body regions had to be given the stamp of approval before we could begin collecting any samples from these healthy subjects. So that turned out to be a really complicated, laborious, and frankly, took much longer to set all that up than, than was initially planned for. Once the volunteers were finally in place, researchers collected up to three samples from each sampling site, eventually collecting more than 11,000 samples in total. They found that despite being from the same person, microbes from each body site are as different as those in the Amazon rainforest and the Sahara Desert. Surprisingly, they did not find highly pathogenic bacteria, but opportunistic organisms were prevalent. For example, Staphylococcus aureus lived in the noses of 30% of the subjects, and E. coli in the stools of 15%. The absence of disease-causing organisms from the microbiome suggests that people acquire these pathogens from other sources. Researchers from nearly 80 universities and research institutes took part in the Human Microbiome Project, those involved had to commit to releasing their data as soon as it was available. At the time, this was an uncommon approach. Scientists were accustomed to collecting their own data and extracting maximum value from it through publications before openly sharing. I was quite pleased and surprised at how cooperative the HMP research community, the HMP PI community was. They were very willing to embrace this philosophy of immediate and rapid release of data sets. And they also understood the value of it, so there wasn't any concerns about being scooped. And I think over the years, the HMP consortium, made up of all the scientists funded by the HMP, really benefited from leading the charge on rapid and public sharing of their data sets. This collaborative approach enabled the researchers to amass large quantities of data. As they delved into the numbers, they discovered that there is no such thing as normal when it comes to the human microbiome. They found a much greater microbiome diversity in healthy adults than previously thought, both between people and between body sites. Not every body site contained microbes from all of the major bacterial phyla known to colonise the human body. Instead, specific groups of microorganisms colonise distinct anatomical niches. Nevertheless, each body site showed a few signature bacteria with characteristic genes linked to that site, although the relative abundances of these bacteria varied from person to person. It turns out naming or creating a catalogue of all the microbes that live in a human won't automatically give you information about what it's doing in your body, nor whether it's a healthy, robust, or imbalanced a microbiome. We really need to go to that next level, which is what's happening in the field now, and that is to actually start eavesdropping in on what the microbes are doing. So uh, move away from who's there to approach what are they doing. We know that we need to understand central biological activities uh, that these microbes undertake and then try to locate those key properties that uh, seem to be associated with a stable microbiome and then contrast it against key properties that seem to be present in a microbiome that seems to be unstable or less than robust. These are all very vague terms, but I think that really reflects on how much struggle we've had in the field about what is a healthy microbiome. In my opinion, it's still an open question. This open question served as the foundation for the second phase of the project, where researchers explored immunity, metabolism and dynamic molecular activity to gain a more holistic view of host-microbe interactions over time. 
Phase 2 addressed three specific microbiome-associated conditions, inflammatory bowel disease, type 2 diabetes, and preterm birth. Inflammatory bowel diseases affect millions of individuals worldwide. The incidence has increased over the past 50 years, coinciding with westernization, urbanization, shifts in dietary patterns, antimicrobial exposure, and other changes that influence host microbiome homeostasis. In phase two of the HMP, researchers followed 132 individuals over the course of one year to explore host microbiome dysregulation during disease. In that short period of time, scientists learned that people with inflammatory bowel disease have microbial communities and immune responses that are significantly less stable than healthy individuals. In numerous cases, the microbiomes of participants with IBD change completely within weeks. This was rare for individuals without IBD. HMP researchers learned that IBD alterations corresponded with certain metabolites, lipids and short-chain fatty acids, several bacterial taxa and host regulators of interleukins. These details may help untangle chronic inflammation in IBD and in other microbiome-linked immune diseases. HMP Phase 2 also explored type 2 diabetes mellitus, which affects more than 10% of the adult US population. Another 30% have prediabetes. To better understand type 2 diabetes at its earliest stages, HMP researchers followed 106 healthy and pre-diabetic individuals for about four years. Insulin-resistant volunteers showed different molecular and microbial patterns from insulin-sensitive volunteers. When the researchers looked at metabolites in these volunteers, they uncovered clinical targets not only for diabetes, but also for metabolic disease, cardiovascular disease, haematological conditions and cancer. HMP researchers also followed more than 1,500 women through pregnancy, collecting 200,000 specimens in their search for bacterial markers of preterm birth. The researchers found several bacterial taxa that are associated with low levels of vitamin D, which are implicated in preterm birth. The research toolbox developed over the course of the 10-year Human Microbiome Project provides ongoing insights into the importance of the microbiome in health and disease. This toolkit has been of particular use in gut microbiota research, where researchers explore the link between gut microbiota and human physiology. The gut microbiome is affected by infant diets, by antibiotic use and by illness and frailty as we age. A child uh, acquires its initial first inoculum at birth, but goes on to develop uh, an, a more adult-like microbiome by about two to three years of life. If a child receives a lot of antibiotics during that period of life, that actually can retard or, or alter the type of microbiome that would likely develop in that child. Because antibiotics are very strong. Depending on the class of antibiotics, it can kill off entire classes of, of bacteria. So it seems that the stage of life at which one receives antibiotics is very important. We're in this odd period in, in, in human history where there have been many important medical advances like antibiotics that we rely on and need. But now as we're learning more deeply about the human body, we're realizing that some of the medical advances that we depend on have these unintended consequences. And I've learned from many, particularly pediatricians, that they're being much more careful about the use of antibiotics because they're now aware that there may be an important developmental window for the microbiome. And they want to make sure that when they use an antibiotic with a patient, it's justified, needed, and that they're aware of any potential unintended consequences. Researchers have explored using diet to rectify gut microbiomes depleted by antibiotics or thrown off balance by disease or other conditions. However, dietary alterations induce only temporary microbial shifts. The scientific community believes that other interventions are necessary to induce permanent changes. Probiotics are live microorganisms that can be consumed as drinks or tablets. They have received a lot of attention, both from scientists and from the mainstream media. Many claims have been made about their ability to promote a healthy balance of gut bacteria to yield numerous health benefits, but so far, these promises remain unfulfilled. 
I haven't yet seen uh, a probiotic that dependably works um, on an individual. We haven't yet identified what are called key microbes in the microbiome. We know certain groups of microbes are very important for producing short-chain fatty acids to feed the gut lining or uh, certain microbes that play a major role in stimulating mucus production along the gut lining and so on. Um, I haven't seen yet probiotics that play those central roles. I, and the FDA is really struggling with how to go about defining what's a safe and effective probiotic. In fact, to the point that the FDA calls this whole class of, of interventions live biotherapeutic products in order to kind of almost set a new stage, if you will, for this class of interventions. Researchers continue to inch forward in understanding how the microbiome influences human health, while the tools and techniques developed by the HMP rapidly propel molecular biology research in numerous fields. Beyond health, the HMP has helped to reshape the research community. Microbiome funding and research centres have expanded in part due to the HMP, and data sharing between research groups has propelled microbiome research into a new era. There is no other HMP beyond the 10-year program. It basically did its job by building the research toolbox. And I think we proved it by demonstrating that, in fact, in, in a 10-year time span, we went from two to three institutes to now 21 institutes funding in the area. We went from $5 million a year to now 100 to $150 million a year. With such considerable interest and investment, researchers in this expanding field should soon answer questions about the human microbiome, including what drives its variation over time, between populations and within geographic regions. Ultimately, the goal is to translate the findings into clinical interventions, a monumental challenge that will require continued multidisciplinary collaboration. Thank you for listening to The Scientist Speaks. This episode was produced by the Creative Services team for The Scientist and narrated by Catherine Loidel. Please join us next month as we discuss the unique ability of humans to appreciate musical pitch. To keep up to date with this podcast, follow The Scientist on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.